This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 284 was recorded on August 12th, 2021. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by escrow.com, the world's most secure online payment system from a counterparty risk perspective, because the funds sit in escrow. Economic Cycles Research Institute co-founder Lakshman Achuthan returns as this week's feature interview guest. Lok says all those economic cycle indicators that were turning up last we spoke with him are starting to turn down now, meaning the risk of an economic cycle downturn is heightened. But does that still translate into a bearish outlook for the stock market in this new normal post-GFC monetary policy regime? Maybe not. We'll find out in this week's interview. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview when Grant Williams joins us for a special cameo appearance. In keeping with tradition, we'll be skipping our usual market wrap and post-game segments for the next two weeks when we'll be airing our 2021 summer special on the decentralized finance revolution featuring Dr. Pippa Malmgren and Clint Cox. That special series will air on August 19th and 26th, and then we'll be back to our usual format on September 2nd. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Eric, S&P 500, 52-week highs, more of the same. What's your take on all of this? Well, hey, we got a worsening pandemic with a new variant that's, uh, you know, seems like just <laughs> par for the course. The melt up continues. I continue to think this is all about monetary policy. Uh, I do think, as Jeremy Grantham is warning, that it all ends badly someday. But boy, how many years have uh, so many people, including myself, been making those warnings that these valuations are just crazy stretched, only that for them to double again from there? How many times has the S&P doubled since uh, the 666 print back in 2009? And how many times will it double again before this, uh, this finally makes some sense? I don't know, but it seems like the trend is up. All right, well, let's talk about the dollar index because we continue to hold up around the uh, 93 handle. I mean, it's still holding up along the top end. Do you think that uh, there's at least some, over the short term some further upside on the dollar? Well, we're holding, uh, as you say, at the high end of the range, but we're still in a consolidation range. There is no higher high until we get a closing print over 93 spot 50. And even then, you know, how much higher does it need to be to really confirm that you've moved out of a consolidation into a new uptrend? So I don't think there's any story to tell here about the dollar index other than it's still consolidating between 89 and so far about 93 and a half. All right. Well, let's uh, turn to crude oil. I wouldn't mind knowing what the inventory numbers came in at, but it's interesting because crude oil really looked like even a week or two ago that it was ready to make another bull run. And just over the last two weeks, we've seen a distribution cycle right back to the July lows near 65. We're now approaching 70 again, 69 at the time of recording. How's this uh, playing out in your mind? Well, Patrick, I think it's all about the Delta variant and particularly the pattern that we've seen where each weekend we get new negative news about the Delta variant and the number of infections and so forth. And it's really eating into Chinese demand. And that's where the the price has been dragged down. And we get some of that news and then it starts to look like it's all getting better. And then we get dragged down again with the next bit of news. I think that once we get to the point where the Delta variant bad news peaks and, you know, are we there yet? Maybe. Then I think the bottom will be in for crude oil and that will continue a grind up higher from there. The whole story in crude oil for the last six months has been everybody's fear that this month, August, would be when we would be seeing like eh, 20 million barrels per week of average drawdowns on crude oil inventories in August. And that's going to just cause the market to go crazy. Well, guess what? We're seeing inventory this week of crude oil drawing down less than half a million barrels, 447,000 barrels. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 325,000 barrels. Gasoline drawing down 1.4 million barrels, but that's offset by distillates building 1.8 million barrels. So on whole, it's basically, you know, kind of flat. U.S. production, meanwhile, is ticking up. 
to 11.3. That's 100,000 barrels more than, uh, than it was last week. Overall, what I see is basically the bull market, I think, has been put on hold while we wait out this Delta variant and see how much demand destruction it's ultimately going to cause. I'm convinced, though, that it's just a matter of the bull market being put on hold. I think oil prices are going to resume their upward trend. When that happens, I'm not sure. It's going to be when we start actually seeing some of the uh, the drawdowns line up with predictions. And for as long as Delta is driving the, uh, the demand down in China, it's going to delay things. But I think that the higher numbers are still coming probably before this year is out. All right, Eric. Well, we got to talk about gold because for over a month, gold has been in a tight trade range of like $50 and it seemed like it was like watching paint dry. And suddenly, come Sunday uh, uh, in the uh, European session, the uh, gold market came to life and uh, well, to the downside though. What's your take on how this played out? Well, Patrick, the, the Sunday move clearly has everybody talking about, you know, is this a conspiracy theory or, or what's driving it? Jeff Snyder's done some interesting work giving alternate answers that it's not necessarily somebody intentionally trying to crash the market. But boy, showing up on Sunday night in thin liquidity and selling, what was it, $4 billion notional or something uh, of gold futures, um, it sure feels like somebody is selling sloppy on purpose trying to crash the market. And we were right at a very vulnerable spot in market history when this happened. We were just teetering with that 1,800 support level. And I remember me saying, boy, watch out. If we get a daily close below 1,800, the move could accelerate. Well, the, <laughs> the ingredients were there for it to accelerate. Somebody knew that, and they decided to fan the flames is the way this looks to me. That got us all the way down to 1,680 again. Congratulations to anybody who was uh, swift enough to buy it when they had the chance below 1,680. I still think that ultimately this will resolve to the upside. But boy, this is, uh, uh, you know, definitely threw the technicals off. It's going to take a lot of traders that trade primarily on technicals to, it's going to force them to change their strategy and not be as optimistic, might delay the uh, the recovery. So somebody did some real damage here. Was it done intentionally? It looks that way to me, but who's to say? All right. Well, let's touch on the 10-year treasury yield because for several months, we've had yields, you know, backing off from 175 all the way down to 115. After retesting last week, uh, right before the jobs number, the 115 level, suddenly uh, yields are uh, ripping higher as bonds are consolidating. We're back to 136 on the yield at the time of recording. Do you think that that was a, a meaningful turn in yields? Well, I think it's interesting. A lot of people thought one spot 34 was going to be either a support or a resistance level. Seems we've traded through it a couple of times now without it really showing either one. And of course, one spot 34, I think that was the low yield intraday in 2016, the first time that uh, Jeff Gunlick declared that the, uh, the bond bull market was over. So that number doesn't seem to be really that critical. The number that seems very critical to me is about one spot 75, where everybody freaked out last time. If we get back up there, I expect them to freak out again, and, and everybody will be saying that the bond market is crashing and the, the sky is falling. I don't think so. I, I think this is just noise, but we'll see what happens. Well, this week's feature interview guest is Economic Cycles Research Institute co-founder Lakshman Achuthan. Eric, why did we uh, invite Lak back onto the show this week? Well, Locke is a super guy, and ECRI, the company that he co-founded, uh, just produces some fantastic data that for anybody who's not familiar with the, the ECRI cycles uh, indicators, I certainly recommend learning about them, and that's what we'll cover in this week's interview. We've had him on before. When we talked to Locke last time, he was telling us that a whole bunch of ECRI's cycle indicators were turning up, telling us that things are about to take off, and sure enough, they did. Now he's going to tell us in this interview that the cycle indicators are starting to turn down. So stay tuned. I don't want to steal Locke's thunder, but that's where we're headed. Well, Eric's interview with Lakshman Achuthan is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was brought to you by Abex, a fintech company traded under ticker symbol ABXXF on the OTCQX in the United States and ABXX on the Equitas Neo in Canada. Abex was founded on the principle of creating market-based solutions to solve the world's most challenging problems. Two of these issues in particular, the energy transition and climate change, are creating once-in-a-generation opportunities for investors. 
Abex is leveraging proprietary Web 3.0 technologies to digitize and accelerate the velocity and security of commodity trading markets, beginning with liquefied natural gas and carbon. Investors seeking exposure to the fintech applications powering this new era of the ESG economy can visit www.abex.tech or www.abex.exchange or check out ABXX on the Equitas Neo or ABXXF on the OTCQX exchanges. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Lakshman Achuthan, founder of the Economic Cycles Research Institute. Lok has prepared a slide deck to accompany today's interview. Registered users will find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, it means you're not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, click the red button that says looking for the downloads. Lok, it's great to have you back on the program. Last time we talked, you were, I think, earlier than most people, calling out the inflation turning up the, the way that uh, clearly it has. Are we still looking at, and I think it was not just inflation, but you were looking at business cycles turning up and a number of things. Let's do a quick review of what we discussed last time we had you on the program and what's changed since then. Sure, sure. Hey, and uh, good to be back with you, Eric. Thank you. I think we spoke in the fo- last fall of uh, 2020, uh, and we were kind of updating several cycle upturn calls. And we, we look at many different cycles uh, at ECRI. And so we had the business cycle upturn in the United States. We had the global industrial cycle upturn that we had also made from the spring of 2020, which was, I, I think has been a very key call. And then the related inflation cycle, it's a separate cycle upturn call that we made late last summer. And on each one of those cycles, there's been really interesting developments, mostly, I have to say, to the downside, decelerations uh, that we've been working through you know, with, with people we speak with and our clients in recent months. And so you know, last time we were on, we weren't equivocating. You know, uh, there, there was lots of uh, drama in the headlines. So there, it seems like that's the norm these days. But during the whole, all the upturn last year, we did not equivocate on those upturn calls at all. Stocks went certainly along for the ride. Commodity prices went along for the ride. Inflation stuff went along for the ride. Even though you know there was lots of stuff going on, pretty serious stuff with the pandemic and also uh, alongside the political strife. And all those calls, they held straight through the winter, but they started to, to show up like different cycles started to peak out. And and you you mentioned, uh, thank you for mentioning the slide deck at the beginning of the call. We have this many cycles framework, uh, what we call the ECRI framework. It's not a model, right? So nothing I'm talking about today is about models. It's about an array of leading indexes, coincident leading indexes of different distinct but related cycles that we're tracking. And there's dozens of them. There may be dozens of them for one economy, and we're doing them for 22 economies. And so it's from that vantage point that I'm giving comments today. And our basic process that, that's important to understand, and it kind of sets up this discussion, is that once we've made a cycle turn call, like last year is the all the upturn calls, you know, almost almost immediately, our job is to be on the lookout for the next downturn. What's the risk of, of that of that cycle turn, you know, that cycle turning again? And as I've intimated now, Global industrial growth, we've made a downturn call in global industrial growth. And I think we should get into the nitty gritty on that separately. So full a period on that and then a full stop and then a separate cycle is growth in in the U.S. economy. And so here, it's quite separate from the global industrial downturn call. We have a U.S. growth rate cycle downturn call. And... Um, there are some, you know, that the on the inflation cycle call where, you know, we, we did have that strong upturn call, our forward looking future inflation gauge that the, the highest reading in that looks to be back in April and it's uh, kind of gone sideways a little bit. So we don't have the the emphatic run up that we had earlier and, and we can get into what's going on there, too. 
This is fascinating to me. But it resonates very much because I had Darius Dale on a few weeks ago who said, look, secular inflation is here to stay, but nothing goes in a straight line and it's already gone too far too fast. And he thinks that we're about to see that counter trend, wrong footing move that throws everybody off, everybody finally ready to, to you know, dive in on the inflation trend only to find that we're going to have a whiff of disinflation for 6 to 12 months before the secular inflation resumes. It sounds like what you're saying is very consistent with that. Would you come to those conclusions, or is that reading too much into it? Well, no, I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't argue on the face of it with that view, but I think we probably build it in a different way. And that that can be very interesting when, when the you know, various listeners – have a framework and an approach or some uh, some scenario that they're kind of thinking about. What the cycle indicators can do is help time when some of those things might come to the fore. And so, and we've talked before, Eric, you know, I don't want to date us, but it's probably years ago about a long-term decline in trend growth and in various major market economies that have d- developed and even the emerging markets. And along with that brings with it some longer term or maybe secular disinflationary pressures. And then you have the policy such as it is, right? It's mostly been monetary policy, but there's now the, there's more deficit spending too, which is trying to push against that. And and without debating all that, right? That's 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 the tug of war that's going on here. And within that, as far as we can tell, and and you know, I'm the third generation of, of this type of work, so it's it's almost reaching back a hundred years at this point. As as far as we can tell, free market oriented economies, right? I'm not I'm not going to be too dogmatic about it. There's there's uh, plenty of uh, uh, machinations and you know pushing around the the free market, but as long as it's dominated by the free market, so even China or or the U.S. or other other economies that have a lot of uh, intervention going on, if you're dominated by free market activity, you're 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 going to end up being cyclical. You'll have the ebb and flow, and so you can have a secular rise in inflation. You can have a secular decline in inflation. That could, you could have either one of those views, and there's still going to be cycles overlaid on that. And there's this desire often, or, or not, I don't know if it's a desire or a reflex or whatever, but there's a conflating that happens between the cyclical move and the secular view. And, you know, I think most listeners who've kind of had some experience in these debates and discussions will be comfortable with the idea that it's really hard to see a secular change when it's happening. You could see it in the rearview mirror, but super hard to see it like, hey, now we've switched and we've made a secular shift the other way. That's a tough one. And it can often get confused with just a cyclical event, which may last for several quarters one way or the other. And so I'm not entirely sure about the secular. I don't want to bang the table on it. I have some some suspicions, but I am pretty sure about the cyclical. And I can say with pretty high conviction, we've got a global industrial growth downturn. I can say with almost as high conviction that we have a U.S. growth rate cycle downturn. And the current inflation cycle upturn, I think everybody acknowledges the inflation cycle upturn. They may attribute it to different stories. From our vantage point, the cyclical component is pretty big. And um, the forward-looking indicators on the inflation cycle, for the time being, seem to have topped out. You alluded earlier to diving into the nitty-gritty of the cyclical indications. Let's go ahead and do that and talk about what's going on here. Sure. I think first and foremost, right, let's stick with the, again, I'm dating myself. I'm in my midlife crisis, right? I'm in my 50s now. So <laughs> I'm, I'm saying, like, what are, what are the really special things in life? It's, it's really special to have conviction about something. You know, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And so when you when you, you go through your processes, and in, in this case, I'm sharing the cyclical process, and when you have conviction, it's kind of, you know, that's special. We have conviction on the global industrial growth downturn. And I mentioned, that, again, I'll refer back to the slide deck. If you go to page four of the slide deck this time, 
there's a there's a, a chart of uh, indicators of global industrial growth, and on that slide, you can see why we have. I'll explain why I have some conviction. Uh, so the target is at the bottom of the slide, and that's global industrial production growth for some 22 economies around the world, and it's slowing. Okay, so that's the target, and. Um, then there's the global industrial growth short leading index in the middle and the global industrial growth long leading index at the top. And you can see that the global industrial growth long leading index has a very long lead, actually topped out quite a while ago. And, and it was at the end of 2020 that we first indicated to our clients that, hey, there's some storm clouds way out there on the horizon. But we we knew that the ongoing global industrial growth upswing was was going to persist. I mean, there were a whole bunch of cyclical dynamics at play, and we knew it was going to persist for, for a few more months. And and we said so. We said, hey, you know, you could still make hay, but um, start keeping an eye on the exit door. Then in, in March of uh, this year, several months ago, based on the global industrial growth short leading index, or the, or the GIGSLI, that's the middle line in the chart, we knew we were closing in on the peak in, in global industrial growth. And so, you know, this these storm clouds were getting a lot closer to shore, so to speak. And then by May of this year, it was pretty clear to us, and we said so, that global industrial growth, the slowdown was already at hand and, and it was beginning. And, and the actionable kind of information here, right, is that there's a, a, a high rise in the risk of downturns in commodity price inflation and the global PMIs. And, and I know, I'm sure you've heard this a lot, you know, a lot of people talk about the PMIs as a way to get a read on what's happening with economic growth. You know, so the PMIs are a survey and they have a, maybe a, in theory, a short lead over the target. Now, the target is the hard data, actual industrial production growth. And as it turns out, the PMIs don't have that much predictive value. They're super important because everybody watches them. And so for that reason, you cannot ignore them because there'll be reactions to what the PMI does. But what you could see from this chart is, is that um, now if you go to slide three now, if you back up a minute, you can see the global PMI against the same target, global industrial production growth. So the target is always that hard data, like what's happening in reality. And that, that slide three shows that the global PMI actually turns around the same time as actual industrial growth. And this year at the peak in global industrial growth, which has already happened, the PMI, which has started to turn down, right? It's gone down a couple of months, global PMI. It actually is lagging the cycle. So the way that our work is used is to time that sh that moment of risk in the market when when things that the that people pay attention to say in this case the PMIs are are going to maybe surprise and go the other way and that sequence that i showed on on chart 4 of the long leading and then the short leading and then the actual the target turning down Depending on on your own risk profile, whoever you know, whatever the institution is, or, or or the portfolio that's being managed, or whatever it is, you know, you could be more or less uh, aggressive in how you approach these cycle turns. But when we see a long leader turn, and then a short leader turn, and then very short leaders like the PMIs or commodity price inflation turn, and actual, the target, in this case, an industrial production growth turn, you have a lot of conviction that it's not noise, especially what's going on, say, with commodity price inflation coming down or industrial production growth easing. Let's talk about how to extend that and apply it to markets, because I can see several points on this GPMI graph where there was a clear sign of topping and a turndown, but boy, it wasn't the time to short the S&P, was it? Yeah, S&P is, is slightly different, okay? So on this slide, and, and it's, a great, it's a great question, 
and boy, S and P has kind of evolved <laughs> in how it in how it fits in a portfolio over the decades. But right here, I'm going to kind of oversimplify with broad brush strokes and say that this global industrial growth, uh, the the cleanest link there, is with broad industrial commodity price inflation. Okay, that's a nice clean link to market prices between this cycle and that aspect of the market. Now, clearly, commodity price inflation then, you know, it, or commodity price even levels, if, if, the, if the growth downturn is strong enough, you're going to see a move in the level. If, if, if those things start to move, they're going to impact other assets in the portfolio construction. And, and so when you switch over to something like broad equities, Right again, and le- and let me put my my own warning label here. Equity doesn't make market calls; we make growth and inflation cycle calls, and and then that that's our bread and butter. And what I'm sharing after that is, hey, where there seem to be some linkages between the markets and those calls, calls and growth and inflation cycles. So you know we have conviction about calls and growth and inflation cycles, and and when we look at the relationship between say equities. And cycles, the the link seems clearest between cycles and overall growth, economic growth. So far, I've been talking about global industrial sector growth. So say the manufacturing sectors of all the major economies around the world. That's the cycle I'm talking about. We're going to put a period there and move forward to cycles in U.S., in this case, U.S. economic growth. And cycles in U.S. economic growth have a relationship with, say, the S&P. And up until the global financial crisis, which kind of marks the, the shift towards extraordinary kind of, or well, I don't know what you want to call it, whatever, some QE or whatever you want to call it, right? Up until then, growth rate cycle downturns, decelerations in U.S. economic growth were associated with cyclical downturns in share prices. And when I say cyclical, I'm being very specific. I mean, pronounced, pervasive, and persistent declines in share prices, so cyclical declines. Persistent could be a couple of quarters or more. Post-GFC, the persistent part of the decline in share prices associated with growth rate cycle downturns was largely removed. Okay, So you'll have a pronounced decline in share prices. You'll have a pervasive decline in share prices, hard to hide. In, in say S and P, but it won't persist. It won't go on for a couple of quarters, which it used to do pre GFC. Post GFC, you, what you have are major market corrections are associated with growth rate cycle downturns. So now we come to today, and I, and I could talk about the history of that in the last ten years if you'd like. But but the operative thing for today is that we have a growth rate cycle downturn call. And the market is, you know, somewhere near the highs, right? So what does that mean? In our assessment, in our kind of observation of how share prices, S&P, reacts to growth rate cycle downturns, that's where we see the larger now corrections in share prices. And so they could be double-digit percentage points, over, over 10% declines. And we haven't seen one of those since the COVID recession uh, took hold. So we would say another way of saying that is that the risk of a correction in the market has um, gone way up recently because of the growth rate cycle downturn, the cyclical growth rate deceleration that is uh, unfolding now. And if you if you actually go to slide six, and it's titled uh, U.S. Coincident Index. I think you can kind of visualize what I'm talking about. And, it, and it's interesting because it, it, it brings us to the current debate like, hey, you know, things are slowing, but so what? It's, it's, it's still pretty good. And 
you know, that may be true, but the relationships are still as I just uh, outlined them. So on this slide six, you have U.S. coincident index growth rate. Um, this is not a forecast. This is uh, just a fact of the hard data that defines the economy outside your window. So it includes the key measures of output, employment, income, and broad sales, much broader than retail sales. And you could see the COVID recession, it was uh, short and nasty. And the growth in the coincident index went negative 20 plus growth rate. And then the rebound uh, saw the growth in this indicator spike uh, just as much to the upside. And, and some of that volatility earlier this year, end of 20 and into 21, is being kicked around by the income measures being hit by variations on the stimulus. Uh, you know, the, the, you know it, it hits and then it's off for a few months and then it hits again. And so you get a little jumpiness there. And if you kind of just even with in your in your mind's eye, get rid of those uh, that jagged kind of peaking out in growth that occurred around the end of Q1, early Q2 in this chart, you can see that it's rolled over. And so coincident index growth has actually edged just below 5% from readings as high as, uh, you know, in the, in the teens and almost approaching 20%. And, and so that's undeniably a slowdown. The question is, where is it going to go from here? You know, trees don't grow to the sky. Hey, this thing had to turn down. We understand that. But where's it headed? And, and, and also, you know, there, the analysis that there was going to be a slowdown is not based on some year over year comps getting harder or whatever. It's just that the forward looking data turned down. And if you, if you switch to the, to the slide seven, you get another view of this kind of sequential monitoring of, of turns, again, from a, a slice of our framework. We have dozens of indicators for the U.S. economy. I'm showing you here some, a sequence of indicators on, on slide seven of uh, indicators for the aggregate economy, not for any sector. And um, the long leading index is on top. The, the weekly leading index is, is second from the top. The short leading index is second from the bottom. And the coincident index growth, same, same indicator that you saw on the earlier slides, uh, six, is, is at the bottom of the chart. And um, what you see is that the long leading index growth rate for the overall economy turned down several months ago and way before this becomes important for you know the current headlines way before the delta variant became a concern so something cyclical was getting set up a while ago and it also doesn't have as i mentioned anything to do with the base effect issue that is going to make year over year growth rates go down. It, it's totally unrelated what I'm showing you here. And, and I'm sure a lot of people are, are still going to feel that you can dismiss what I'm saying because it's just kind of like tough comps and, and, and base effects or whatnot. But, but take my word for it that our analytical methods sidestep the entire issue of base effects. What I'm showing you here is unaffected by that. And as I said, the downturns in the longer leading indexes uh, uh, started well before Delta surfaced in the United States. And so when you have the long leading index turned down, the weekly leading index, it's a shorter lead, follows suit. The short leading index, shorter lead, also turns down. The coincident index itself turns down. Hey, you know, if it, if it, if it walks like a duck and quacks or whatever, it's a duck, right? This is, this is a cyclical downturn. And the, the, the next question, after having made that call, is, is there any side of an upturn? And our long leading index is, is not showing a sign of the next upturn in economic growth. And so here we are. 
Okay, so if I summarize all of this, you've got a pretty darn good track record at predicting economic cycles. And back in the day, pre-GFC, economic cycles used to transmit pretty directly to stock market and other asset classes. It seems like what we're really dealing with is in this new era of monetary policy post-GFC, that price transmission mechanism is kind of broken down, still works for commodities better than it works for stocks. But it seems like, you know, the stock market just they keep buying the dip every time it happens, no matter what kind of data we're looking at. It seems to me that, you know, we, where we ultimately have to be headed, as a lot of people have said, is someday they, they just do too much borrowing and spending beyond their means and blow up the whole system. Is there anything in your models that starts to track when deficits really do matter again and when that national debt reaches a point where it truly becomes problematic now, not just someday? The answer is yes. I mean, we're all about when, right? The, the problem is that the, at least in our view, when looking out, um, two or three years from now, uh, that stuff may not have been determined yet, right? There's a lot of road between here and there as to what happens a couple of years from now. When we are looking at our cycle indicators, and not for lack of trying, okay, but the farthest we can we can really get uh, some bead on, on, on the risk of a turn or the risk of something snapping is about a year. You can't go a lot farther than that with any usefulness and uh, in, in terms of the applying that data to a decision. And, um, and that's why I say maybe it hasn't been determined. I could see the structural stuff. There's a long-term decline in trend growth. We see that. And we see the policy response, which is to use more and more, you know, debt or, 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 or interest rates or however you want to say it, low interest rates to, to, or deficit spending to, to prop things up, keep things going. And sometimes, I guess, if you double the amount of of whatever you're doing, it, it you know we we used to use this phrase years ago. It's kind of like the Red Queen effect, where if you have to run twice as fast just to stay in place, and um, you know that may be what's going on here, right? And and we don't know exactly how 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 many times you can double the amount of debt without something breaking, but we can monitor the cycle indicators to see if things are running away one way or the other on growth we see the deceleration we can we can infer on this chart by the way that i just landed on the the chart 7 you could see it's you know we don't forecast by analogy but you could see what was going on post gfc and so post gfc the long leading index took off the weekly all those leading indexes anticipated the recovery by the way when most of the world was looking for a depression these indicators went up and so they they nailed the recovery call in in march of that year they were they 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 were they were super early when people were still talking about depression and stuff but then what's interesting is they nailed the downturn call so we make a growth rate cycle downturn call i think in december of 09 and um, back then, it was Vice President Biden, who in the spring of 2010 was tasked with kind of promoting the recovery summer, which ran right into the slowdown. And it was important for markets. I don't want to suggest that the stock market has disconnected from economic cycles. You had a 16% correction in the market. Uh, that began in April of 2010. So nobody wants to walk into that, right? You, you know, as a as a manager of risk or a manager of portfolio, you you definitely don't want to just take that. So if you know they're going to buy the, you know, they're going to intervene, and 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 practically every one of these growth rate cycle downturns, once the powers that be kind of are, are confronted with that, they react, you know, and and that that truncates the um, maybe the certain aspects of the market. In this case, we're just sticking with equities. So how do you manage that? I mean, there's, you know, uh, one, one extreme version is that you just buy insurance. But the problem is, right, you don't want to be buying insurance all the time. You don't need insurance all the time. You need insurance during a growth rate cycle downturn. You don't need insurance during a growth rate cycle upturn. To the contrary, you could sell it, right? So, that's the 
the way you you may kind of modify how you interact, say, growth rate cycles with equities. Now, switching gears, I'm oversimplifying. We got commodities, we have equities. You also have fixed income, of course, right? And and, and the 60, 40, 40, 40 portfolios have a lot of money sitting in, in fixed income. And so there you, you have, you know, what are real rates and what are inflation expectations? And the real rate has collapsed totally in line with a growth rate cycle downturn. So super important for that aspect of your portfolio. And, you know, we'll see where inflation expectations go. I think that we can't predict the predictors. We have to watch where the future inflation gauge goes. It nailed the inflation cycle upturn call. It has not given us an inflation cycle downturn call yet. Uh, so those inflation expectations components, we don't have a a clear downturn call there just yet, but that's what we got to watch for. That's what we're paid to do is to determine, is there a cyclical downturn developing there? And, and that's what we're working on right now. We've been talking about how the transmission of these economic cycles to the stock market is not really what it used to be pre-GFC. It seems to me, though, that commodity price transmission is a little bit more direct because those commodities are either needed or not needed and have to be produced in a certain time frame. So in terms of what we're seeing here as we think about other assets like, let's say, crude oil and copper, which are traditional inflation hedges, should we be expecting a downturn cyclically in those assets as well? You know, the short answer is is yes. Those are tradable in exchange traded industrial commodities. And so we track very, very closely sensitive industrial materials prices, many of which are exchange traded, many that are not. And almost all the time their cyclical direction is the same. Uh and occasionally for for maybe speculative reasons they'll diverge a little bit. But then wherever those non-exchange traded ones are, are headed tends to be the right direction. Commodity price inflation itself has already turned down, the broad commodity price inflation. So I'm talking um, energy, um, base primary metals, textiles, and other miscellaneous kind of building materials and other things. And that is not over. That is probably one of our higher conviction calls you could you you know that that global industrial downturn is not over and just as good as it feels on the way up uh in terms of hey this is really strong it's one for the record books and so on and so forth you can get that same kind of violent reaction to the to the downside we you know, it's known as the so-called bullwhip effect where the size of the cycle really uh, ampli gets amplified up the supply chain. So commodities, industrial commodities, are, are way up the supply chain, right? Or this could also apply, say, for, for something like semiconductors, in theory, right? Because anything that's a really early input where you have a lot of capital investment to create it uh, or to, to extract it or build it or whatever – and and it's still this really early input. So your supply of that tends to be kind of linked to whatever capacity you set up. So if you set up a lot of capacity to to, to extract something, to to build something, um, you're going to run it. And the demand for that then can make those price cycles fluctuate very wildly. And um, that's going to happen here. It's already starting to happen. And it's not over. So what'll be, you have different aspects of the market that are starting to move. You have commodity price inflation starting to move, maybe even some levels. And I don't think uh, oil or copper are going to dodge it entirely. There, you know, there may be some supply things here and there that make a specific commodity act a little different for a little while. But the, the broad backdrop is a cyclical downturn in global industrial growth, which will take the whole group, it'll put downward pressure on the whole group uh, in terms of uh, the inflation cycle in, in those prices. And as we said, the growth rate cycle downturn 
it, let's say in the U.S. or even in starting in, in in other countries around the world, that puts pressure on real rates, and so you're seeing those move. You're seeing you're probably seeing. I think you, I know you, you're seeing a movement in commodity currencies. So things are moving, and in that circumstance, I think saying that there's a growth rate cycle downturn, so the risk of a correction in equities is a lot higher than it was uh, in past in the past year. It sounds entirely reasonable to to conclude that having you know looking at at what we're looking at. Let's talk a little bit about precious metals, which is a near and dear subject for many of our listeners. On one hand, I suppose you could make the argument that economic cycles, industrial cycles, don't really affect demand for precious metals because it has more to do with investor sentiment. On the other hand, that sentiment, I suppose, is driven <laughs> to some extent by the cycles. How do you think about precious metals? Do your, are your cycles effective in anticipating precious metals price moves, or is it a little too disconnected? You know, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's more of the latter. It's a bit more disconnected. If you can, if you can narrow down to a uh, you know, an industrial activity kind of driving the price of something, then then we can make the cyclical link. But if there's the speculative component, which is, you know, pretty large, say for gold or something, then that becomes uh, quite a bit tougher. I think, uh, you know, if you get a, a market correction, and when I say correction, I'm talking double digit percentage decline. Uh, if you get a market correction, I think those those assets will probably, at least on a knee jerk basis, be a safe haven. I would I would uh, think, but I you know I just hesitate because everybody's buying Bitcoin and stuff. But that's also a risk asset, right? So it's it's a very volatile asset. So I think that's where you know when you get the the what is very likely to be a correction of size, I think, associated with the growth rate cycle downturn, those other assets are going to move. I want to correct, I just want to clarify something. Since the GFC, I think there's been about four growth rate cycle downturns in the last, you know, 10, some over a decade or so. And that's not a lot of sample size, right? It's okay. Um, It's not a lot. And We've seen corrections show up rather quickly. I mean, in a matter of months or so after a, a GRC, a growth rate cycle downturn starts in three out of four of those instances. During the um, 14 to 16, late 14 to, to, to 16 um, growth rate cycle downturn, it took a couple quarters until there was a correction in the market. And and that was a a downturn in in uh, economic growth that was focused very much in the industrial sector. It was a there was actually a global industrial downturn, and the U.S. industrial sector also succumbed to that. So people who were focused on that sector or that aspect of the U.S. economy certainly felt it or were, were aware of it uh, pretty quickly. But maybe someone who was looking at the broad market just didn't see it right away. And so in that instance, the correction took a, almost a half a year to show up. But it still happened. It was still there inside the growth rate cycle downturn. Locke, it seems like big picture here, you're talking about a pretty significant downturn in the economic cycle, not necessarily a direct correlation to the stock market cycle. How big of a, I mean, are we talking about a recession call? Is that really what you're making here? No, that's an excellent question. Uh, and the answer is uh, no, there, there's no recession call. The reason it's a big call is because we're looking the other way, right? And not because of base effects and not because of the Delta virus. If, if none of those things were, were issues, we'd still be making the call based on the drivers of the cycle. Consumption of goods, consumer consumption of goods it hasn't only slowed, it's actually falling, right? The level of, of goods consumption is falling. And while our consumption of services is increasing as the reopening kind of progresses. It's not offsetting that that downturn. So we have an overall growth rate cycle downturn call. It's it's bringing housing. There's stuff in there with supply and, and prices that are slowing some of the activity there. Infrastructure is 
going to put some demand out there, but it's it's really spread out over so many years. It's not a game changer. And so my guess is that as people kind of come around to the idea that things are slowing, we may get people talking about recession. We don't see one. We're not, we don't see a recession, but back in 2010, 11, um, with the, with the disappointment that the growth didn't continue, you know, the, the market's pretty uh, manic depressive. It goes from one extreme to the other. And so I wouldn't be surprised if that comes up, but we don't see it on our radar. Locke, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview, but before I let you go, for the benefit of our institutional audience, please tell us a little bit more about ECRI, the Economic Cycle Research Institute. I started to call you the founder of that organization, but it's actually like three generations old. What's what's the story here? It's three generations old. So early years, first generation, it was the National Bureau of Economic Re- Research. Second generation, it was it was largely the Center for International Business Cycle Research at Columbia University, which is where I joined. And then now, since the mid-90s, we've been known as the Economic Cycle Research Institute, completely independent. So we're not talking to anybody's line. We're just telling you where the, we're monitoring these indicators. And we have institutional clients, and, and uh, they're you know, big fund managers or asset managers and big companies, uh, C-suite type situations. And I, and I want to share something that came across in my email. It was a quote from Jeff Immelt. You'll, you'll remember the GE uh, head for, for many, many years. And I'm using his words now, quote, knowing what to do isn't that hard. Knowing how to do it isn't that hard. Knowing when to do it is really hard, unquote. And, and that's what we're about. We're we're about, hey, when is this going to crack and go the other way and surprise someone? And so I think the PMIs, for example, are great. You know, great. Like, is it noise or not? They've come off for a couple of months. I don't know what it means. Hey, we know exactly what it means. It's all part of this cyclical array of indicators, and it's coming in right on cue, and uh, it's going to be uh, easing. And so that arms you to, to, to make a better decision in, in managing your risk. Locke, we look forward to getting you back on the show in a few months for another update. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Escrow.com is the payment system for buying and selling anything of value. Cars, boats, airplanes, jewelry, gemstones, fine art, collectibles, intellectual property rights, domain names, bringing in shipping containers from overseas, or even buying and selling entire businesses. It's simple to use. Either party sets up the transaction, then the buyer sends the funds to escrow.com. The seller is then instructed to send the goods to the buyer to inspect. Within the inspection period, the buyer can return the items for any reason. After that, Escrow.com pays the seller immediately. Escrow.com is the world's most secure payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Over 2 million customers have transacted over $5 billion on escrow.com, and eBay and Shopify use it for cars, boats, luxury watches, and business sales. It's available in the United States, Canada, and Australian dollars, euros, and British pounds. Never buy or sell anything online unless you use escrow.com. Escrow.com is a subsidiary of freelancer.com, listed on the OTCQX best markets under the ticker symbol FLNCF and the Australian Securities Exchange under the ticker FLN. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. So joining us now for a post-game conversation is Grant Williams. Uh, thank you for coming on the show, Grant. Yeah, you, you've, you, Eric's been schooling you in name pronunciation. I can hear that, Patrick. Nice, <laughs> nice attempt. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm the schooler now. I, I'm who you look up to as the, the pronunciation chief. Eric, your it's name your now. school. We're all just pupils in it, my friend. You know that. <laughs> Well, in that case, let's move on to my favorite subject, which is your absolutely outstanding dollar end game series that you produced with Bill Fleckenstein, where you guys did a tremendous job of analyzing how the current fiat currency regime might end someday, right up to the point where Lacey Hunt handed you the answer to the grand prize question on a silver platter, and you guys both missed it, which is, 
that the U.S. dollar gets replaced as the global reserve currency with a digital reserve currency. And I'm not talking about cryptocurrency. What do we have to do, Grant, to get through to you and Bill <laughs> that crypto is not the same thing as digital currency? Well, look, I, I, I don't think you need to get that through to us, Eric. I think, look, I think a lot of people, us included, are guilty of using the term crypto in, in way too broad a fashion. I, I totally accept that. Instead of being somewhat more surgical with it, I think it's just become an easy catch-all. You know, first of all, it was Bitcoin, and then people would distinguish between Bitcoin and blockchain, and then we kind of got to crypto, and now you have to, to kind of distinguish that and distributed ledger technology. So, you know, your, your points about Digital currencies, I, I absolutely understand where you're going with that, and I'm and I'm happy to have that conversation with you. I know when, when you talked about it being dropped on a platter, you know, I, I I think the conversation we had post that with James Aitken, our second conversation with James Aitken, really brought that to the fore when he talked about the DCEP in in China, and it was clear at that point that th there is a whole other discussion to be had around central bank digital currencies as opposed to bitcoin or crypto or whatever you want to call it so uh, you know I, I'm, I'm very happy to have that conversation with you well i should let our listeners know too this was not an, an outright ambush grant and i grant and i uh, <laughs> discussed this ahead of time but i well, really no, what, what we actually the conversation was actually do you mind if i ambush you and i said no <laughs> which is well that's that, a friendly way to do okay it. <laughs> that was good enough right yeah i think so Okay. Well, let's continue the ambush then. Yeah, let's go I was for it. Let's go for quite, it. Quite I'm, I'm looking the other direction. We're, we're doing a special on, the, on this in the next two weeks with Dr. Pippa Malmgren and Clint Cox talking about the same issues. And I, was, I, I want to make sure our listeners understand, too, it wasn't just a setup for the ambush. I very sincerely no, 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 believe no, no, that the Dollar Endgame series is some of the best podcast content anywhere. So I really encourage our listeners to check that out. But I do think that the answer to the question ultimately is the current fiat monetary regime eventually gives way to a digital currency system, which is almost certainly not Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency. It's more likely either a central bank digital currency, CBDC, or what I call a Silicon Valley digital currency, SVDC, something like, I think Facebook's Libra was just a flash in the pan. But the question is, what's the next big tech currency system? I think the really big topic that nobody is talking about, and you're the guy that I would expect to be talking about it, Grant, is the future is going to be about a space race for who's in charge of designing the digital currency system that replaces the U.S. dollar and all the rest of the fiat currencies. Are you on board that that's where we're headed? And do you think it's it's worthwhile to try to figure out who the winner is going to be or who the likely contenders are? Or is it too early in the game? Well, look, look I, I, to be honest, Eric, this, 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 I mean, as ambushes go, this sucks because I largely agree with you. So, um, so you know, let, we'll let's, work on that. Yeah, right. let's, 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 let's change it from an ambush. But, but look, it, as, as I said, the, the conversation. Bill's Bill not here. Had, let's pick on him. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Um, the, the second conversation Bill and I had with James Aitken, where he brought up the DCP, you know, the Chinese currency, was was a real eye opener for both of us. And I think that was where, I, you know, I had this nebulous concept of, of a central bank digital currency. I, I knew it was something they were working on. I knew it was something that solves an awful lot of problems that the central banks are going to face. There is no doubt they're going to face these problems. They're not necessarily a good thing for the citizenry of the countries that ultimately institute them. But at that point, at this point, rather, that's very much a secondary consideration of a lot of these people, I suspect. So, you know, what James said, and, and I would urge people to listen to that conversation, he talked about conversations he's had, he'd had at, at very high levels with government officials in, in multiple jurisdictions. The Americans were shocked at how far ahead the Chinese were with their central bank digital currency. And we've seen that now being trialed. There are millions of people trialing that in China already. He said that the the powers that be, the penny had finally dropped and they recognized what a game changer this is and how dangerous it is to allow the Chinese to be that far ahead with the technology, the implementation, you know, and every kind of facet of this. So I, I, I it's definitely on my radar, it's definitely on Bill's radar. We haven't covered it in that much detail since people have touched on it, but it's not really been 
the focal point of a conversation. And, and I absolutely agree with you. It needs to be. You know, what, what I've found as I've kind of tried to navigate a path through the cryptocurrency world, and, and, I, and I will distinguish that from what we're talking about, but what I've found, you know, I have a, I have a very high aversion to dogma. It's something that I've discovered over the last 15, 20 years that, that where, wherever I see dogma, it, I have a visceral reaction to it. Because I, I think anytime you, you, you run across people who have the answer, it's very dangerous. You know, I don't have the answer to anything. I have an answer to lots of things, but I'm very much aware and conscious of the fact that what I have is an answer, not the answer. And so, you know, I've found that whole space to be something where the dogma on both sides of the argument is is problematic for me and trying to have conversations as I, as I know you found in that in that space is difficult simply because of that level of dogma. So w- when it comes to the central bank digital currencies, I'm hoping there is a little less dogma about it because they are kind of nascent, even though we do have a, a, a very good example of, of how they're going to work in, in China. But for me, Eric, the, the necessity of this as, uh, I'm going to choose, choose my words carefully, as a weapon for central banks makes it all but inevitable, I would think. Oh, I think it's absolutely inevitable. And what I don't think most people in finance understand yet is that what money is, functionally what it does and how it's used, is about to be re-engineered. And I think that part of that will be re-engineering the entire fractional reserve banking system, not just the currency system, so that how credit is extended can be modernized as well. And that potentially upends the balance of power in the entire banking system, because I don't think that the banking system as we know it today, is really necessary anymore once we get to the technology that's coming, that's ahead of us. And it will need to be replaced with something else. And any time you have disruptive technology like that, it means that usually the longest standing old players in the game get knocked out and they get replaced by newcomers that nobody's ever heard of. And I think that where this ultimately, the, the grand prize is whoever's in charge of designing the digital currency system that eventually replaces the dollar as the world's reserve currency. I think that is the grand prize in this game. And I think that Google and and Facebook and other tech giants have figured it out. And they're now strategizing, saying, hmm, do we work with the central banks and sell it to them? Or do we try to just take over and use our market clout in order to get public adoption of a new money system that's not government issued? Or, or do we figure that the, the crypto guys pissed off the government so much that we got to get the governments on our side? I think Silicon Valley is struggling with that question now as they basically I how they're going to re-engineer what money is, how credit works, and how the entire financial system works over the next 20 or 30 years. So I think this is just insanely big. And what's crazy to me is that this silly little sideshow called cryptocurrency, and Bitcoin in particular, still gets all the attention that it gets when it's obviously not the most important thing to pay attention to. Uh, So I think you and I probably agree on that point. But boy, nobody, as far as I can see, has really come to terms with the fact that how money works is about to be re-engineered. Well, I I think a lot of people um, will use the terms digital currency and cryptocurrency interchangeably. I I think that's that's one of the issues here. I, I know I'm guilty of it on occasions. There are times when I, I catch myself and I, and I realize that I do need to be more surgical in my choice of words, but I, I will use those two interchangeably. But, you know, the question here is, is really one of, of money and power because you know, there's, the, there's the Amstel Rothschild child, uh, quote about, you know, give me control of a nation's currency, and I, I care not who runs the armies. I forget. I'm bastardizing the quote completely. But money has always been power. And this is one of my big questions about what we're about to go through is the necessity of, of the establishment, if you want to call it that, although that word is somewhat pejorative, or, or you know, the current system, or however you want to term it, giving up that power of having control over the world's money is, is not something anybody ever does willingly. So w- whatever happens here, there is going to be a struggle. Now, whether that struggle is between governments and Silicon Valley or whether it's between Silicon Valley and the establishment banking system or whether it's a a, a melee between all three, 
I don't know, but there will be a struggle. And, you know, as in the title of the film, there will be blood. Now, the, the, the question is for me, whose blood gets spilled? Because ultimately, uh, assuming a central bank digital currency is the way forward. And, and I, I, I'd love to come back to whether you're talking about, in effect, a digital SDR that will be a truly global currency or if this is an arms race between sovereign nations. But let, let's come back to that for a second. But ultimately, there is going to be real blood in some way, shape or form amongst us, the people who use this money, because one of the big things that digital currencies do is is enable deeply negative interest rates to be imposed. And and I think we can probably all agree that there is a high likelihood that they will need to be imposed. So that could well be one of the first things that central bank digital currencies are used to implement. We may find ourselves caught up in the battle and have ease of credit taken away from us. We don't know. But there are going to be an awful lot of dead bodies on this battlefield when all said and done. And I just wonder how that plays out, Eric, and how you think that that battle plays out in, in the short term. Well, I'm trying to figure it out, and I'm trying to get more people that are willing to talk to me to try to figure it out, because so many people seem to be ignoring this, frankly. But I think, as you said, money is power, and more importantly, this technology has hit the scene at a time when there is a very, very strong social will to change the balance of power. So some of some examples of things that could be designed into a government issue currency system could be expiration dates. You know, you've, you've got some money, but we're only going to give you X amount of, you know, you've got three years to spend it and, and those dollars expire worthless like airline miles at the end of those three years if you haven't spent them because AOC and the squad decided it didn't make sense for savers to be, you know, keeping their money and not sharing it with other people for years at a time. And, and they decided to, to make it better. Obviously, I don't agree with that from a, a policy standpoint, but I think those kinds of things will be contemplated and there will be a vicious public debate, mostly held by people who don't understand what's actually being debated. And it'll be driven by a lot of emotion. And, you know, just like like tax things uh, tend to be debated. But I think the real question, and it, it's a complete mystery to me at this point, is do we see Silicon Valley try to take the the you can't beat them join them approach of going to central bankers and saying look you you guys have a monopoly on issuing money we're not going to try to take that away from you because we saw what you did to facebook when they tried to and uh and kind of learned a lesson there so we're going to design something that we sell you that we license you so that you the central bankers can issue the digital currency but we're going to design a really special google digital currency that you can you can issue it through that's going to uh, do a whole bunch of cool things and, oh, by the way, benefit Google a- along the way. Does it go that way or does it go with Silicon Valley getting much, much more brazen and just saying, look, it took governments more than a decade to figure out what Bitcoin was and they still haven't figured out how much of a threat it poses to them. We have the opportunity right now to just re-engineer the world's money, use a platform like Facebook to make it popular and get to the point where Truly, governments don't have the ability to stop us because there would be such a public outcry if you took away everybody's favorite payment system that they'd all fallen in love with. The same way, you know, when we first introduced Apple smartphones that were going to take your picture, and it's widely known that those pictures got shared with the government. Were were people afraid of it? No, they were lined up around the street in sleeping bags waiting to buy the first one, even though it was possible to have one pre-ordered to be sent to your door the same day. People get excited to get the latest technology, and I think Silicon Valley potentially has the opportunity to sell the world on non-government money, something the Bitcoiners think they can do, and I think they're, they're crazy to think they can do that. But Silicon Valley does have the ability to pull that off, and I'm most scared of that outcome. I actually like the central bank digital currency outcome as the most preferable of the possibilities, just because I know if central banks are in charge, it'll take many, many years to implement it because they don't do <laughs> anything efficiently and 
we won't have to go through this change, which I, unfortunately, I think this could be the greatest change in monetary history for the benefit of society. If only you didn't have sleazy people trying to design features in for their own benefit rather than to benefit the common good. And I think that's exactly where this is headed. And so I, I think it's a, a really scary story uh, in, in terms of where it, it might end up. But I don't know the answer. I'm trying to get more people talking about it. Yeah, look, I, it's interesting the words you chose that when you talked about uh, once it, it kind of got enmeshed, it would be difficult for the government to take away the world's favorite payment system. But that's talking about something completely different, right? When we're talking about payment systems versus money, in the true definition of what money is, that, that brings in a whole bunch of other questions because it's, it's perfectly possible to build a payment system on top of social networks which doesn't use a Libra stablecoin, but which facilitates the transfer of, of goods and services via a pure central bank digital currency. So, you know, the, the two can live in harmony. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But I, as I said, you know, I, whichever way this goes down, there will be enormous benefits for the public in terms of convenience and ease and potential reduction of frictional costs in terms of transactional processes, which is, which is obviously wonderful. However, the likelihood is that, to your point about the phones and stuff, the freedom you have to give up in order to avail yourself of these your marginal incremental improvements in efficiency and lowering of costs, I doubt will be understood by one man in a thousand to, to steal Keynes's old quote. Or was it Lenin's quote? I think it was Lenin's quote, actually. But it's, and, and that's the problem. It, the problem is a lack of understanding of, of what money is, of the reasons why this conversation is so important to have right now because the monetary system is reaching the end of its useful life. And, and look, the only reason it's done that is because, to your point about people, self-interested actors using the system for their own ends, that's where we are. It just so happens that the self-interested actors have been central banks and, and they've done what they've done and created this, this mountain of debt, which has now become way too big of a cancer to, to simply be cut out of the, of the global economy. So, so we're there anyway, but there's just enough complexity around this that it requires anybody who wants to understand it to, to do some work, you know, and, it's fascinating when you when you realize the, the the way that mankind has progressed, particularly as that progression has got faster, the amount of due diligence that the average person does on anything now is falling just as quickly as the speed of being able to do something is rising. And so people now get all their news from the headlines. People don't read the story anymore. And headlines are 90% opinion-based rather than fact-based. You know, I'm just I'm just in the middle of listening to the great new book about WeWork, The Cult of We. It's a it's a tremendous audio book if anyone is into such things. And just listening to this story unfold, and I was like you, Eric, I was cynical about WeWork from day one and, and incredibly cynical by the end of it, and just amazed when the whole thing fell apart that people hadn't seen what this thing was in plain sight. But when you listen to this story from the beginning, you realize this is just a story of ego. This is MBS having more money than you ought to do with uh, and wanting to be a big noise. It's Massa Son also wanting to be a big noise and going to MBS and, and selling him on this crazy vision that would make him a big deal and would make Son a big deal. And then Adam Newman picking both their pockets by pandering to their egos. And, and Adam Newman is just a, a, an illustration of that class of entrepreneur that has no shame and can sell any kind of dream and the bigger you dream, the bigger you're going to get. But just listening to the level of due diligence that was done by anybody involved in this whole thing, it was it was pitiful. And why? Because in this day and age, we 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 get the headlines, we don't want to read the story, and we want to be a big deal and we want to have lots of followers and all this crazy stuff. So unfortunately, we are playing into the hands of this massive shift in the monetary system because it will be sold to a, an ever more gullible, ever more willing, ever less diligent public as incredibly beneficial. And in, in many small ways, it will be. But I suspect, Eric, in many large ways, it will be an absolute nightmare for the public. 
Oh, I think it is going to be an absolute nightmare. And as you said, uh, one man in a thousand at most is going to understand what's happening as it's happening. And we're going to see a re-engineering of how money works so that suddenly governments have more control than anybody ever imagined possible. And guess what? It's all in there and working, and, and they have the ability to delete or extinguish money from your account so that it doesn't exist anymore at the touch of a button, and you can't do anything about it. And that's all in the interest of fighting terrorism, so it's a good thing. Don't worry. Right, right, yeah. You know, and, and by the time anybody figures any of this out, I mean, I shouldn't say anybody, by the time the masses figure out what happened to them, uh, we will have seen a, a change already occur that gives government so much power that they'll never let go of it. So I think it's inevitable that there is a huge loss of individual liberty. And I, I said this as soon as I learned about Bitcoin in, I don't know, 2012 or so. I said, it's just so obvious what's going to happen here. It's like the, the little army that invents the howitzer. What happens is the big army sees you've got it and they outnumber you and they come steal it from you and they, they, they take over that invention and they perfect it and they use it for themselves. Governments are going to steal the invention of the secure digital bearer asset and use it to create digital currency systems that give governments more power than they've ever had before. And it comes at a time when governments are able to slip things like this in without most people noticing. And I, I think it's it's actually even worse than that because it won't even be people not noticing. Very similar to the lessons that have been learned now from things like the camera phones taking your you know your your facial image and sending it to the NSA. What we're gonna have is the advent of some really cool ease of use features that make everybody not just not complain, but enthusiastically embrace and welcome this change to digital currency, which dramatically undermines your, your privacy rights. And, and it, it's inevitable. And I, I think the question, I'll, I'll pose this is the, the impossible question I can't answer, Grant. If you could be in charge of this one thing only, what would be better to have sleazy bankers be in charge of designing the new money system or sleazy Silicon Valley guys be in charge of designing the new money system? Which is better for society? Look, it, 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 yeah, it is a great question, right? I mean, it, it's a really great question. I guess, I guess for me, amazingly, and I guess anyone that thinks I'm a boomer, which I'm not, but I've been called a boomer plenty of times, will not be surprised. But I, the reason I would go for sleazy bankers, even though they are sleazy and plenty sleazy, is because at least the bankers care solely about the money. The bankers aren't going to try and impose a social agenda alongside the currency. And what I'm witnessing coming out of Silicon Valley is far more, I think, dangerous in terms of loss of social freedom, arbitrary decisions about what is acceptable, You know, the, 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 the clear challenges to free speech. You don't get that from bankers. You know, There are plenty of scumbag bankers out there, and uh, they're a sleazy class all of their own. But at least you know their motivation is purely to make themselves money. And whilst I, I applaud plenty of, of agendas that are, that are out there, the problem with the power social media has right now is that it can impose the kind of censorship on people that is the thin end of a very, very dangerous wedge. And, and we are seeing that. We are seeing that on a daily basis with you know the woke culture and the cancel culture. We're seeing just how quickly, how quickly narratives can spread and be spread in ways that you know when you when you actually bother to dig into the whole story, it's never what it's portrayed on social media. So uh, you know it, it's it's Sophie's choice, but I I would I would choose the bankers over the Silicon Valley types to be honest with you. I can't believe it, but I have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, some ambush this turned out to be. <laughs> I know. Patrick, <laughs> help us out. All right, we, no we, need, we need a proper oh, ambush. Uh, there you go. So, Grant, I, I'm going to ambush you here. So, uh, Come on. Re recently I um, uh, read an interview with uh, Jeremy Grantham, who's been uh, outspoken about the extremes and excesses in the financial markets. And you obviously have a podcast titled Endgame, where you have the opportunity to pick the brains of the smartest money managers and economic thinkers out there about these excesses. Yet these markets keep plugging along. Like uh, in your mind, can these excesses just continue without a day of reckoning? Like, uh, can this just be perpetually engineered? Well, uh, look, I mean, it, it's can they continue? I mean, they, they've proved day after day, week after week, month after month that they can continue. 
And, and I think, you know, look, it's very important for, for people to understand when you when you listen to someone like Jeremy talk, there's a there's there's an enormous amount of of prioritizing the scoreboard in this day and age. You know, Jeremy Grantham is a is a great example. John Hussman is another great example. Great thinkers who who put their thoughts out there, put their research out there, talk about what they see, talk about the risks they see evolving, and people then come back and go, "Well, you you know, you were wrong." And I think the, the important point, particularly with someone like Jeremy, who is you know a, a remarkably thoughtful human being, he's he's been a remarkably successful investor. And the rigor and the diligence behind the work that he does and the thinking that he shares with the world is, is literally the best we can hope for because he doesn't know the answer and he doesn't know what the future is going to be. What Jeremy is saying effectively is, I've been doing this for 50 years. This is what the sum total of my experience has taught me. I am going to share that experience with you. And few of us have the kind of experience that Jeremy has. What we do with it then is entirely up to us. And he's not saying, here's what I think, therefore you should invest this way. You know, instead of thanking him, going away, thinking about it, and then making up their own minds, investors kind of go, oh, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about, which is clearly ridiculous. Jeremy Grantham's forgotten more about investing than most of the people <laughs> that will, will, will take pot shots at him, right? right. But, but there's no, none of us know the answers. None of us know the answers to an unknowable future. So the way I've always worked is, is listen to people who know more than me, which is just about everybody, take in what they say, stress test the rigor of their arguments, and then understand how, if at all, that changes my own opinion, what I need to take from what I've learned to, to improve my own feeling. But ultimately, I'm responsible for my decisions, and that's it. And 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 thanks to Jeremy and thanks to John Hussman for sharing their thoughts, even though if you read them and go, well, based on today, he's wrong. He's not wrong. He's telling you what he thinks is going on and why it's important. You do what you want with that information, but you should actually thank him for sharing it with you. All right, Grant. Well, we can't let you off the hook without talking a little bit about precious metals. Now, we're in a window of deeply negative real yields and many commodities in these huge bull trends, yet over the last six months, gold has been a big laggard. Uh, do you suspect uh, that this is just a short-term cycle, or do you think something has changed in the precious metals market? I think it's very unlikely. It's unlikely that something has changed in, the, in a 6,000-year-old in a asset. I think it's very unlikely that in 2021, something changed. Again, it depends on how much you've bought into the fact that gold absolutely should behave like X when the conditions are Y. And of course, that, that never works. You know, if, if you are trading gold, then it's disappointing you every day in, in how you would expect it to act based on technicals, based on the news flow. You would expect an asset to, to move in a certain way. And if you were trading it around, you've probably lost money. If you are investing in precious metals because you think the price is going to 5,000 and you thought the price would be at 5,000 by the middle of August 2021, then gold has let you down again. If you are buying precious metals and owning them as a liquidity reserve to protect and sustain your purchasing power over a a long period of time over an investment life cycle over a career gold is doing exactly what you wanted it to do so it really it really only matters in the short term if you are focused on the short term price it's it's like anything you know you, you don't check the price of your house every day you own that house because you want a roof over your head and you want somewhere to raise your kids you don't check the price every day but when you come to sell it you may decide you want a different house. And at that point, you're going to check the price. And well, you know, at that point, you don't think to yourself, the price of my house hasn't gone up. You think, well, if I sell this house and I want to buy that house, how well has this house protected my purchasing power? And the likely chances are, because housing markets tend to move you know, in reasonable symmetry, that owning that house, even if you've lost money on it, you can probably buy the other house you want to buy for less than you would have bought it six months ago anyway. So you know, people get so fixated on the price of precious metals. And I understand that if you're a trader, that's fine. 
But if you are owning them, if you're owning precious metals for the right reasons, then the fact that gold has gone down to you know from 2000 to the mid 1700s and below it really doesn't make any difference so i you know I, I there's no real answer it really depends on what you're looking for and if you're looking for certain things gold will be you know the biggest disappointment in your portfolio there's no two ways about it and if you're not it, it's just doing fine Grant, I want to go back to your podcast before we close, because frankly, it's the only podcast that I know of that I think is everybody's good is Macro Voices. I, I hate <laughs> saying that, but it's true. I don't think everybody realizes what's happened, though. You were one of the founders of Real Vision Television. You've now kind of moved on and you've got your own podcast, which is supported on Patreon. For anybody who doesn't know about it, guys, you're missing out. It's, it's a really good one. Tell us about it. Where can they find it? And what can they do to sign up? Because it's now a paid subscription service. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Finally, I've got everything in one place. So if you go to grant-williams.com, you can find out all about it. There's there's a ton of episodes of The Endgame, which are out there free. Um, you can find those in the Apple iTunes store. Uh, and since, uh, since I went behind the paywall, I put a preview out. 15, 20 minute preview of every episode just to give people a taste of what we're talking about. But everything you need to know is all in that one place now, grant-williams.com. So go take a look. And I will be politically incorrect and say, if you want every bit of the quality that used to be in Real Vision, you can get it for a small fraction of the price at grant-williams.com. Well, on that note, we're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Avex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by escrow.com, the world's most secure online payment system from a counterparty risk perspective, because the funds sit in escrow. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. Well, this week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the slide deck provided by LAC. There's also a, a link to the Bloomberg article, This Turning Point for Markets Merits a Hard Look, and a look at an interview with Jeremy Grantham as this being the greatest bubble in history. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. That's Eric spelled with a K and myself at Patrick Ceresna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. 
Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit macrovoices.com.